Well, good morning to those who are on the line thus far. I see our attendee numbers clicking up every second here. Uh, we'll start in about a minute or so. Looks like our numbers are starting to plateau. I have 11, I have 11.03 now. Why don't we begin officially? We'll get started. Welcome everyone to the 2023 Better Building Summer Webinar Series. Uh, this is an exciting webinar today. This is a special one for a couple of reasons. Number one, this is the first webinar in our Better Buildings webinar, Summer Webinar Series, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about later on. It's also, uh, one of the highlights for me, this is a webinar that we've now done for this uh, second year running, recapping some of the uh, top summit presentations from about a month ago. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So I'm really excited to be able to uh, share this time with you all and our amazing speakers this morning. Thank you for joining us. I'll give a bit more context once I cover some housekeeping items, and I want to make sure to get this right. So uh, please note that today's webinar will be recorded and archived on the Better Building Solutions Center. We will follow up uh, with the recording uh, and the slides <clears throat> once they're ready <clears throat> and available, uh, as we do for all of our webinars. Uh, next, the attendees are in listen-only mode, which means your microphones are muted. So if you experience any <clears throat> audio or visual issues throughout the webinar, um, send a message to us in the Q&A box that you see uh, located on the bottom of your Zoom panel. I think that's it for housekeeping. So let's go to the next slide. I'll introduce myself briefly. I'm honored to get to talk to you all today. Uh, my name is Nate Allen. I'm a program manager in our commercial buildings integration team within the building technologies office um, at DOE. Uh, I've been involved in Better Buildings for about five or six years now, uh, working across the commercial sectors as well as the public sector. Uh, and I'm filling in today for Maria Vargas, who wishes she could be here, but is in a partner meeting, uh, and sends her regards. Why don't we continue uh, on to a bit more about what makes today a really special webinar. So um, this was a big hit last year when we did this, I don't want to use the phrase best of summit, but uh, in case you missed it, summer uh, series uh, a webinar. Uh, I'm really excited to get to do it again this year. One of the things that makes the Better Building Summit so special is that it's filled with talented speakers and a lot of really rich discussions. It's impossible to be everywhere at once. Um, I was clicking through the slides last night. I know I missed some of these presentations that we're going to hear uh, today, and I can't wait to see more. So the, the format here is we've invited back four speakers from this year's Better Buildings, Better Plant Summit to give their same presentations. I think they're maybe a little bit abbreviated. Um, each speaker is going to give their, their slide deck and their discussion, and we'll all come together at the end for Q&A. And why don't we keep moving so we can talk a bit about how that Q&A is going to work. So we're going to use Slido. Anyone who's at the summit or has participated in um, previous Better Buildings webinars will be familiar with this. I find it to be pretty straightforward on my phone. If you go to slido.com uh, and then the hashtag for today's code is DOE. Um, if you wanna ask panelists questions, please submit them anytime through the presentation through Slido. We'll be answering questions uh, at the end of the webinar. We'll be able to see the ones as they're coming in in real time. 
Um, if anyone likes another question that someone else has asked, you can select a thumbs up icon uh, to denote that, which will then get some you know, most popular questions moving to the top of the queue, but we'll watch them all as they come in. So that's the, the brief overview of Slido. Why don't we go to the next slide uh, about the Better Buildings, Better Plants Summit. Uh, hopefully you're familiar with this if you're joining this webinar today, but for anyone who's not, uh, this is, I'm biased, but this is my favorite conference of the whole year. I uh, remember the first one I attended, uh, it would have been 2017. Uh, and at that point I was just stunned. I, I've attended a lot of conferences over the last 15, 20 years. I could not believe the level of collegiality and openness and just the, the honesty around peer sharing that I was witnessing between Better Buildings partners. And that's what makes this event so special for me. We've been really fortunate the last two years to be able to come back together in person. In both cases now, uh, the response has been overwhelming in terms of attendee numbers. This year, we were back in DC even at the Capitol Hilton, which was really special. And we are hoping next year, uh, well, we're hoping to be able to announce details about next year very soon. I think I'll cover that more at the end of the um, presentation today. Um, if anyone hasn't been to a summit before, I really hope we can see you uh, next year in a future summits. It's a really meaningful, special event. Why don't we continue on uh, to get into what we've all come here for today. So this is this is our lineup of presenters here. We're really fortunate to have Sameda Rao from the Mayor's Office of Sustainability in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, Sadie McEwen from the Community Preservation Corporation, Jules Kunkel from uh, MetLife Investment Management, and Bert Hill from Volvo Group North America. I want to thank them again for being with us today. And let's jump into presentations. So we'll be begin with Sumeda, uh, who is the Executive Director of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability in Louisville, Kentucky. She works collaboratively with partners across Louisville to catalyze robust, inclusive, and collaborative solutions for a more climate responsible and climate resilient Louisville. Sumeda has a background in urban sustainability, environmental policy, and green building in the United States and India. Uh, and she also serves on the boards of the Kentucky Solar Energy Society and the Bernheim uh, Arboretum and Research Forest. In 2022, she was named a future leader by the Aspen Institute among 100 climate leaders in North America under the age of 30. And with that, I will hand it to Sameda to kick us off. Sameda, take it away. Also for to the entire Better Buildings team for the opportunity to both be in DC earlier this summer and to be able to share this work again with uh, all of you who missed it. So I'm going to be talking today about how we are engaging community in our clean energy transition and trying to make that more equitable and with particular focus on our participation in the Department of Energy's Communities LEAP or Communities Local Energy Action Pilot, uh, which was a grant program that we were one of the pilot communities selected through that. So I will jump right in with first a quick introduction to Louisville and some of our sustainability efforts to give you some context. So next slide, please. So hello from Louisville. That's the correct way to say it, by the way. Uh, we are in, for those of you who don't know, we're in central Kentucky, kind of on the uh, border between Kentucky and, in, and Indiana on the Ohio River. We have an MSA population of about a million and we are a merged city county government. Next slide, please. So in Louisville, we have seen that just like most other places in the world we're seeing, or, or rather all other places in the world, we're seeing climate change impacting us. We've recorded increasing temperatures decade on decade, high, heavier rain events. We've seen some devastating uh, disasters in the state over the last year, including tornadoes and uh, flooding and other climate disasters. Next slide, please. In fact, Louisville is actually the fastest warming urban heat island in the US based on a study that we did in 2016 through Georgia Tech's Urban Climate Lab. Um, and this it has to do a lot with our loss of tree canopy, our development patterns, and various other things that are contributing to this, um, to this effect. Next slide, please. And of course, like all places, we also don't experience these climate impacts equally. So there's some parts of the city that experience environmental injustices a lot more pro pronounced than other areas. 
So if you'll see on this map, the areas that are highlighted in red um, experience significantly warmer temperatures, um, air pollution and other issues. And uh, as you might guess, those areas do coincide with the historically redlined areas of our city, uh, which have experienced historic marginalization and do, and, and they do, you know, uh, the residents of these communities are communities of color and lower income communities, um, as you might expect. So next slide, please. So some of the work that our department has been involved with over the last several years is that we've done a lot of studies and plans that kind of help um, us understand the impact that Louisville is facing and also figure out pathways to move forward from there. Um, and some of these important ones are the emissions reduction plan and the climate resilience plan. Next slide, please. So the greenhouse gas inventory that we did in 2016 uh, gave us some insight into where all of our emissions were coming from. And if you'll see, this, this pie looks a little bit different than what some other cities might look, because uh, in a lot of cities, you'll see transportation be a largest slice of that emissions pie. But in Louisville, buildings are the largest slice of that pie, specifically residential buildings. And the reason for that is because we have uh, a building code that's controlled at the state level. And we are on the 2009 energy code, which I, is probably the oldest code in the country. And it's something that the city doesn't really have power to change. Um, so we're on an old building code. We have a lot of old building stock and historic buildings. And our utility is over 95% fossil fuel based. So those factors contribute to our building sector being the leading cause of emissions in our city. Next slide, please. But thankfully, because of all the studies that I mentioned earlier um, and a lot of community support, we ended up passing some ambitious resolutions through our city council recently. So we, the first one is our resolution for 100% clean energy, which commits us to achieving 100% clean energy community-wide by 2040 and, and some interim goals for the city government operations in 2030 and 2035. And also late last year, we established a science-based greenhouse gas emissions reduction target and updated our target to achieving net zero emissions by 2040 and reducing those emissions by half by 2030. So a lot of the work that we're currently doing is focused on achieving these goals. Next slide, please. So um, how are we gonna achieve our clean energy and zero emissions goals? So there's a lot that we're doing both with city government facilities and um, community-wide initiatives that have to do with both energy efficiency and clean energy supply. So I'm not gonna go into depth on everything that we're doing, but I will be focusing on the community's lead partnership. Next slide. So, for those of you who are not familiar with CLEAP or Community Sleep, it is a pilot program that the US Department of Energy announced last year. And it's a technical assistance grant um, that helps communities develop an equity focused clean energy transition pathway. Next slide. So we were one of about 23. I think there may be a few more communities that joined uh, since then that um, are either you know based on location in environmental justice areas or historic fossil fuel areas uh, have been selected to develop these plans to meet their goals given the circumstances that we are in. Next slide. So when we uh, uh, decided to apply for this grant, we thought it was a really great opportunity given that we had just passed some of these ambitious goals, but our reality was pretty stark in comparison to our goals. And we knew that we needed some expert help to get us to our goals and to also do it in an equitable way. Um, so we reached out to some of our partners, the Metropolitan Housing Coalition in Kentucky and for the Commonwealth to, to work with us and be partners on this, on this program. So when we reached out to these partners, the first lesson in community engagement was, you know, in was figuring out how to choose the right partners. And uh, we knew that we wanted to work with some really good, some partners that were doing great work in the community, but there was definitely some conversation about, you know, the, the partners potentially being 
uh, you know, having been very outspoken against the government in the past and would they want to work with us given that they don't really think we're doing the best job. And I think that we made the right decision by uh, approaching them regardless and saying, we know that you have issues with us, but that's exactly why we want to work together. We need to keep each other accountable and make the most of this opportunity. So what we decided to do was to come up with some priorities that include reaching our goals, focusing on our priority sector, focusing on renters, um, utilize, enhancing the utilization of existing programs, uh, developing new programs as needed, building in financial sustainability, and also working within our regulated utility environment. Next slide. So ultimately, uh, in working with these partners and with the National Renewable Energy Lab, who's uh, primarily providing technical assistance on this, we uh, came up with a really big roadmap. So again, this is very early stages, work is still in progress. But what's going to happen at the end of this is that we've decided five different areas that we're going to help map out that'll help us get started on this clean energy transition. And that includes um, identifying low hanging fruit for affordable housing requirements. So we decided to focus on the affordable housing sector and particularly renters because there's that split incentive between renters and owners of properties. Um, we decided that we needed to do some kind of community benchmarking, we needed to do a policy analysis, workforce development, and also financing. So we basically have to create this whole ecosystem around affordable housing and start to deliver those energy savings benefits to our low income renters first, and then try to scale that up community wide. So that's where we are. And um, I'm hoping that maybe in the next year or so, I will be able to share a little bit more on where we landed in terms of our roadmap and how we're going to progress going forward. Next slide. That's it. Uh, that's our website. You can check us out and learn more about other programs that we have going on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samita. Uh, I'm going to do a quick transition to try and keep us on track here in terms of timing. Next, we'll hear from Sadie McEwen. Uh, Sadie is the president of the Community Preservation Corporation. In this capacity, she leads the development and implementation of CPC's growth strategy and oversees all of the company's field offices, construction, lending initiatives, uh, equity, and impact investing platforms. Sadie brings an eye toward collective solutions to her focus on addressing the capital challenges facing disinvested communities having harnessed dozens of municipal tools and public subsidy programs to drive affordable, sustainable, multifamily development and economic revitalization. Sadie has developed a passion and skill for aligning private resources and government priorities for impact and change. With that introduction, I'm gonna to pass to Sadie and I'll also offer uh, one quick reminder to uh, anyone who may have missed the intro that we're using Slido, the hashtag is DOE and we look forward to answering more questions at the end of the session. Sadie, I pass to you. Thank you, Nate. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me back. Um, I don't have slides today. Um, the session that I participated in at Belder, Better Buildings was just a conversation, which was led by Mark Zuolaga from Cadence 1-5. Um, it was myself, Joe Evans from the Kresge Foundation, Josh Earn from uh, National Housing Trust, and Stefan Samarapas from uh, ACEEE. And the, the conversation was, uh, it was titled Multifamily Meetup. Um, and we were really focused on identifying resources under the Inflation Reduction Act that could be used for multifamily housing. Um, so we had representation from traditional financing, um, community development financing, CDFIs, um, philanthropy, as well as utility incentives. So we, we talked about a bunch of things initially on IRA and then really focused on the inflation um, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which is a $27 billion uh, program being administered by the EPA, um, Environmental Protection Agency, and it's $27 billion for nonprofit lenders. Um, for those of you that have been in and around non not-for-profit lending, um, this is a, uh, an opportunity for nonprofit lenders at a scale that has been completely unmatched in history, um, particularly since if you are a multifamily lender, um, there are lots of resources that will help support affordability in housing or historic preservation in housing or adaptive reuse, environmental cleanup. But to date, there has not been a source specifically addressing climate and housing. And the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund uh, really, really does uh, address that and allows multifamily 
financing, um, both through the mortgage system, but also in mid-cycle capital, um, through leasing um, tools to access very, very low cost capital so that we can try and use that low, low cost capital to make um, the transition to um, net zero ready housing a possibility. Um, having been in affordable housing for now 32 years, it is very challenging to do affordability alongside of sustainability because all of the resources support affordability. We have an affordable housing crisis in this country, which cannot be ignored. And so you really can't divert affordability resources to support sustainability. So we're thrilled to see the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund um, bring those resources to the table. Um, the Greenhouse Gas, Gas Redu Reduction Fund has um, priority in just as 40 communities. Um, and so 40%, a minimum of 40% of the resources must be used in low income and disadvantaged communities. It's seeking obviously significant greenhouse gas reduction in the multifamily built environment. Uh, the capital is hoping to transform financial markets so that this money is not a one and done, it touches a project and goes away, but rather it can inform existing capital markets as to how to address climate and sustainability in the work that we do and then recycle that capital so that it can be used over and over again. Um, the focus of the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund is on existing buildings, clearly a large driver of greenhouse gas, distributed energy, um, so getting us to transition to clean sources of electricity, and then transportation, which is of course another large emitter. Um, and so broadly, um, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund does three things. It builds capacity in the lending community so that the, the lenders that are out there that are doing lending that are not focused on, on climate can hire and build out resources within their organizations to address sustainability and climate. Um, it provides debt, very, very low cost, cheap debt to blend with existing private sources to make overall debt cheaper so that we can achieve decarbonization. Um, and then, you know, from where from where I sit, it also helps us to then inform policies going forward relative to what was successful using this capital. Um, there's $7 billion in a, in a pot called Solar for All that will go to states and municipalities um, to help drive solar, particularly into low and moderate income communities, either individual installations or community solar. Um, there's 6 billion that um, not-for-profit lenders can access to both build that capacity that I mentioned, but also add uh, balance sheet capacity so they can go out and leverage additional dollars to get this lending off the ground. And then there's 14 billion, the biggest pot, uh, which is to drive direct access, um, direct lending through the private sector. Um, the reasons that we need this capital in multifamily housing is for, there are really two reasons. First and foremost, we are at the very expensive <laughs> early stage of the transition um, to clean energy and buildings are the most challenging. And I would argue that affordable housing and multifamily, particularly small buildings are the most challenged of that subsector. Um, and so, you know, the, the second reason, reason is that those economic challenges. If you've been in affordable housing at all, you know that the affordable housing capital stack is already packed with other sources and there's nowhere to put new debt. You can either do pre-development loans, which are great, but they, and they get pay, paid back at the time of the construction loan closing, but they typically don't influence the scope of work. Um, you can do straight grant money, which is often what HUD and other government sources do for affordable housing. Um, or you can look at the existing capital stack, which is there's a slice of private debt in there, try to shrink the cost of the private debt, um, lower the cost of the private debt so you could increase the proceeds, adding more money to a project um, so that you have additional sources to pay for heat pumps, geothermal, air source, uh, solar installations, deep energy efficiency. You can't just electrify a building, as we all know. If you're going to electrify it, you need to ensure that it has significant um, energy efficiency as well. Um, and so we, we looked at where that money, where the money can attach um, in the multifamily um, financing ecosystem. And that's either through first mortgage capital, through mid-cycle capital, uh, supplemental debt, or it's through um, you know, leasing tools, you know, like solar leasing. Um, and the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund really endeavors to address all of this with a focus on economic justice. Um, to Sumeda's point, we cannot leave low and moderate income communities behind 
I like to think of it as we are investing in low and moderate income communities um, and helping them transition first, because if they get left behind, we will simply have to subsidize those buildings um, when they are, remain on oil and gas, which will be much more expensive in a disinvested grid. Um, and I think it's more palatable to say we'll invest now rather than, than subsidize later. Um, and then, you know, we really talked about the complexity of trying to scale um, investment in multifamily housing because of several things. We don't have a consistent building code, and that doesn't look like it's going to happen in the very near term. We have lots of incentives, but in the grand scheme of things, it's a very small amount of capital with a tremendous need. Uh, we don't have regulation around for financing institutions like we have with the Community Reinvestment Act, which has helped drive investment in low-income communities. It'd be great to have a Climate Investment Act where private lenders were incented or forced or regulated to invest in climate. Maybe that's coming. Uh, we don't have broadly a lot of private sector financing tools that reach deep enough with affordability, particularly in this high interest rate environment. Um, we broadly have uh, unawareness. There's a lack of people being aware. They're not educated. There's a lack of trust. Um, and you know, there's, there's not a lot of great data out there. Um, and so we really talk about using this money to try to solve a whole bunch of those problems primarily by pushing it out through private lending to address specifically decarbonization of buildings, which can then inform policy around regulation, around building code, um, and help lenders understand how to address climate in the work that they're doing, particularly at this moment in time, when there is more and more disclosure coming to the private sector around how they are looking at and addressing climate and carbon in the work that they do. It's very easy to identify your scopes one and two if you're an organization that's looking to be carbon neutral. Addressing your scope three, which is how you're doing your lending and, and your investing is a, a whole nother matter. And so we're really hoping that this capital and the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund through nonprofit lenders who have the integrity and the, and the mission to address climate and sustainability really helps inform the private sector market as to how we can get to decarbonization broadly. So that's what we talked about, and I will stop there. Sadie, thank you. You speak so fluently on this topic and you covered that so clearly without slides. Uh, we're going to do another quick transition. Our next speaker is Jules Kunkel. Uh, Jules serves as the Associate Director for ESG at MetLife Investment Management, where she works on all matters related to ESG for equity, debt, and agriculture uh, across her portfolios. Currently, Jules is focused on expanding MetLife's on-site solar PV and improving best practices in energy management across the equity portfolio as they continue on their path to reach their goals towards decarbonization. Prior to this role, uh, Jules worked for seven years at BEIC, both in Honolulu, Hawaii, as a senior consultant, where she supported the Hawaii Energy Program, and in DC as a senior account manager with the DC Sustainable Energy Utility. Jules has also worked as a sustainability analyst at the Tower Companies. Jules, with that, I pass to you the microphone. Thanks, Nate. Um, and good morning, everyone. Um, so as Nate mentioned, I'm the Associate Director for ESG at MetLife Investment Management, or MIM, as I'll refer to for short. Um, and um, so today I'll talk a bit about our approach in terms of how we plan for the future using climate risk assessments. Um, so next slide, please. Actually, we can we can skip to the next one too. All right. So um, MIM is the institutional asset management business of MetLife, and within our commercial real estate portfolio, we have about thirty billion in equity and eighty billion in debt. We participate in DOE's Better Buildings and Better Climate Challenge, and annually re we report to GRESB and to PRI, among other frameworks and organizations that are listed here as well. Um, and next slide, please. So first to set the stage, I just wanted to define the two kinds of risk I discussed today that we consider for both new acquisitions and um, for our existing commercial real estate portfolio. So the first one is climate risk. With this, we consider the physical risks from climate change, including acute risks such as tropical cyclone, flooding, and wildfire, as well as chronic risks, including sea level rise, drought, and heat stress. The other is transition risk. And here I've included the categories by which the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures or TCFD characterizes transi transition risk. So we have to consider policy and legal risks such as the continuously emerging building performance standard or BEPS laws, 
um, technology risks, uh, market risks, and reputation risks too. Um, next slide, please. And actually, we can skip to the next one. So um, first, I'll discuss our approach to transition risk, especially in regards to new acquisitions. At Summit this year, we heard a lot about BEPS laws, and um, I think at this point, there are at least 42 jurisdictions around the U.S. that have either passed a BEPS law or have committed to passing a BEPS law through the National Building Performance Standards Coalition by as early as Earth Day next year. Um, so this represents over 25% of the U.S. building stock. And we assume that within the next 10 years, most if not all major US metropolitan areas will have passed one of these laws. So to prepare for this, we've started to take action by making adjustments to the terminal cap rates for properties at the time of acquisition. Um, underwritten exit values are adjusted to account for this carbon penalty legislation. So we prepared for this by altering the number of basis points associated with an asset on its ENERGY STAR score. And that's largely because ENERGY STAR scores might be the easiest metric for us to use during the due diligence process, given that energy benchmarking laws exist in a lot of jurisdictions throughout the US. So those with ENERGY STAR scores greater than a 75 have cap rates positively adjusted, while those with a score of less than 50 have their cap rates negatively adjusted. Um, and then looking into some industry research regarding how penalties from BEPS laws could impact property NOI, we're hearing that while BEPS laws could have a minimal impact on asset types such as warehouses and industrial buildings, for Class A commercial multifamily retail and hotels, they could um, cause as much as a 2 to 3% decline in NOI. And then I'm sorry, for Class B and C, we've heard uh, there could be anywhere from a 3% to a 20% decline in NOI. So it's something that we, we really want to think about. Um, we're making these cap rate adjustments because we're not just thinking about how the building fares currently or even its market value for when we sell the asset, but we want to think about two sales from now. And um, one thing in addition to our cap rate adjustments that we have at the time of inquisition or acquisition includes feedback that is required from the ESG team when any property that's considered for acquisition is brought before our investment committee. We also have ESG development guidelines for properties under construction that encourage things like all electric buildings, building beyond energy code, and tracking embodied carbon. Um, next slide, please. And then in addition to new acquisitions, we also consider transition risk for our current portfolio. Um, our team has onboarded a new ESG software tool and it's called the Brightly Stream platform. One of the reasons that we selected this tool was because of a module that it offers called the Zero Carbon Tracking Module. And some screenshots from that are depicted here. So this allows for us to be able to project a property's performance over time to ensure that we're meeting specific goals. So you might be able to see on the slide that there's a green curve. This right now represents the CREM pathway, but we can also change it to show requirements for something like Local Law 97 or another BEPS law, um, or even our MetLife goals. And we're building decarbonization pathways for each property in our portfolio to see what kinds of energy conservation measures or ECMs will need to occur at properties in order for us to remain in compliance with BEPS laws and meet our stated goals. And we can project ECMs into the tool so that way, um, a property's performance looks more like the graph that's on the right rather than the graph that's on the left. Um, next slide, please. And actually, we can skip to the, the next one, too. So now I'm going to focus on climate risk um, and the way that we assess uh, physical risk from climate change. So we use a location risk analysis tool, and it's called the Munich Re Climate Risk Platform. We use it by entering a property's address or coordinates into the tool, and it's required that we run this tool during every during due diligence for every new acquisition for our equity portfolio and loans for our debt portfolio also. Um, we also run an annual analysis each year for our existing equity and debt portfolios, and we assess for the hazards that you can see listed here. Um, in the Munich Re tool, we use an RCP factor of 4.5 and assess for hazards out to the year 2050. Next slide. 
Um, so based on the results of the Munich reanalysis, we then have our own internal tool where we will incorporate the results and, um, and then it offer, <clears throat> offers a weighted score. A uh, property can either rate as low, medium, or high. If a property is rated as having a high risk, both our regional architect and our internal risk team have to weigh in on the results in order for us to move forward with the acquisition or determine if any climate risk mitigation measures might be required. Um, next slide. So to close out, I'll show an example of a climate risk analysis that our analyst Erica ran for a retail property within our portfolio that's in Fort Worth, Texas. So when running the Munich Re, uh, Munich Re tool, this property showed that it had a high risk score due to its exp exposure to flood risk. And um, we completed a deep dive and found that in August of 2022, there was a flooding event that occurred in Fort Worth, Texas. But luckily, this property was not harmed. Um, next slide. When looking at this, slide, or this site more closely, we were able to use the elevation tool within Munich Re and found that our property sits at a much higher elevation than the water source that causes the flood risk, um, as is depicted by the area circled in red here on the slide. Um, next slide. And then the next step, we kind of um, uh, took this analysis a bit deeper and then really viewed the property in Google Maps, where we were able to see that there is a flood wall that's shown here, as well as a levee too. Um, because of municipal flood mitigation measures, as well as the property's elevation re relative to the river, we felt okay with this property, even though it was initially showing um, a high risk in the tool. So that's just an example of one of our climate risk analyses. Um, and that's uh, what I have for you. Um, so that's where I'll close my presentation um, and I'll pass it back off to Nate. But thanks everyone for your time this morning. Thank you, Jules. And I want to thank uh, Sumita and Sadia Jules. We're perfectly on time for this. This is wonderful. Leaving time for our fi final speaker, Bert Hill. Uh, I did not plan the speaker order as it's worked out, but I think on a personal note, it's somewhat perfect that Bert is going last. So our summit this year was uh, April 11th to 13th. It was that second week of April. And that Thursday afternoon after summit ended, I spent about an hour talking to Bert, <clears throat> uh, hearing about his work, and I was so impressed. And I'm so glad to see you back here. And it's fitting from my perspective that you're going to take us home on this presentation. So Bert is the Health, Safety, Environmental, and Energy Manager for Volvo Group North America. He has over 35 years of experience in health, safety, environmental, and energy issues. He coordinates the Volvo Energy Network of North America, which is Volvo's forum for identifying and spreading best practices in energy management throughout the company. He also manages Volvo's participation in the DOE Better Plants Challenge and the Better Climate Challenge programs as well as other corporate level initiatives. Bert, I pass to you. Okay, thank you very much, Nate. And Bert, we can hear you and now we can see you. That's perfect. Okay, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll start with a little bit of context about Volvo Group. Um, we sold off Volvo cars in 1999 and lovingly became known as Diesel Volvo. Um, because most of the products we sold, the trucks, the buses, the construction equipment, the marine and industrial engines ran on diesel. But now we've signed up for SBTA targets, and in, a little, in around 17 years, we will be lovingly known as battery electric, biofuel, and fuel cell Volvo. And you've seen transportation mentioned in a, in a couple of, of the other speakers. So, so we around the, over 95% of our emissions are, are scope three when our products are in use. But I'm going to look at a couple of our scope one, scope two, scope two emissions. So go ahead and change the slide, please. So this first case study I showed is a very small, very ancient boiler we have at our Middletown, Pennsylvania remanufacturing facility uh, that's used for building heat and process equipment. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what we looked at there was, a, was an upgrade to an electric boiler. And the take, take home message here as is the boiler doesn't cost that much. Um, you see at the very bottom there, the boiler was 153,000, but what costs the money, what costs money is the upgrade to the electrical service. 
and in this case, which was nearly a, a half a million dollars. And this is typical of what we've seen in other um, electrification projects where we're, we're looking into doing this. Um, the, the utility agreed to put a, a new service into the building, but then we had all of the, the upgrades to do on the interior of the building. Next slide. <clears throat> So, um, but the, the big gain here was, you see, and this is our standard uh, method for, for evaluating the environmental aspects of a, a new investment. And you see there, CO2 emissions is taken into consideration. And in this case, um, this, this going to this electric boiler would reduce our CO2 emissions by 387 metric tons which comprise 76% of the plant total in this case. So using our new um, carbon, carbon tax, internal carbon tax, and some other mechanisms we have to promote energy savings projects, we were able to get this one over the line. Next. The other case study I showed was for forklift replacement. And I left this slide in just for reference. Um, if you'd like to go back and look at it later, if you want to go to the next one. Um, and here, um, if you're an environmental nerd like me, there, I found a very good life cycle assessment study on the left there, if you want to dig into the details. But it's, it's hard to see, but the bars on the right side of the chart are the electric alternative. All the way on the left are the is the propane um, alternative, and you can see there the environmental impact over the life cycle is much higher with propane. And on the right there, you see that you can easily see, at least with CO2 emissions, if you go from propane at around 17,000 kilos of CO2 for a year to electric, uh, which is only 4,600. So that's kind of a no-brainer if you have uh, propane trucks and you're going to electric. Next slide. <clears throat> In our case, we were we have primarily uh, lead acid forklifts, and we were looking at going to lithium. Uh, this was a fleet of about 30, 30 lift trucks. Um, what you see was they they are much um, more energy efficient. We much more electric use around sixty thousand dollars a year savings just on the electricity uh, from going from lead acid to lithium. Uh, the lithium batteries last longer. They have a higher um, health, safety, environmental impact because they, the lead acid, they have lead and sulfuric acid, which has to be reported to the EPA every year if you go above a certain amount on those. And then you also have the potential uh, generation of hydrogen when, when you charge the batteries. So if you go to a lithium or fuel cell, I mean, you get away from those issues. And then you also have lower maintenance costs on the, on the lithium because you don't have to fill those with water and wash them as you do with the, the lead acid. Next slide. Um, you can see there was, it was a large gain in, in operating costs and also in electricity consumption. So th this, this project went over the line. Um, Particularly if you have propane and you're moving to, to lithium, um, it's, it's really no question. And even if you're going from lead acid to lithium, we saw, we saw a very good return there. Next slide, please. So uh, since, since the summit, um, we had a great event at our powertrain plant in Hagerstown, Maryland, that I, I wanted to add to this. Um, we did a pilot together with the DOE, with Oak Ridge, West Virginia University and EPRI. And what we did here, we combined an energy treasure hunt with an electrification assessment. Uh, we've done a lot of energy treasure hunts, but this is our first full blown electrification assessment looking at an entire plant. <clears throat> uh, so this kind of covers the first two pillars in the DOE industrial decarbonization roadmap, the energy efficiency pillar and the electrification pillar. Um, so in the energy treasure hunt, we're looking at low to no cost energy savings, mostly operational and behavioral aspects. And there we identified energy savings opportunities around 7% of our energy 
spend at the plant, mostly related to HVAC control, furnace insulation, and compressed air improvements. And then on the electrification side of things, that's focused um, on carbon emissions naturally. Um, and there we followed the model developed in the DOE low carbon pilot program. And um, that brought us to a point where we could actually prioritize and further analyze project ideas for electrification. And if you go to the next slide, I'll just leave you with this. Um, the electrification assessment framework developed by the DOE. Um, it, it, it works really well. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to repeating this process now at other plants. Last slide. Thank you very much, Nate from the DOE and everyone else for listening. Thanks, Bert. Um, well, on that note, I want to recognize that Better Buildings is a team effort. And we have an amazing group that works on this day in and day out. I know this morning I'm joined by several of my colleagues uh, on the line. I want to briefly recognize them. I see Josh Geyer from HUD. Josh oversees our multifamily efforts. Uh, Hannah Nabilius is here from BTO. Hannah oversees our commercial sector activities, as well as all of our Better Climate Challenge TA. Uh, John O'Neill from our Industrial Efficiency and Decarbonization Office is here. John oversees our Better Plants engagement with industrial partners. I apologize if I'm missing anyone. That would include Shannon and Laura from our State Community Energy Programs Office. By and large, we are just so lucky to have such a strong team working on this, and uh, it's a privilege to get to work with all these great folks. Let's move on to q and I'm glad we have uh, about 13 minutes here um, to talk about these presentations and answer questions. I've been following Slido on this screen here, and I think we're going to put it up on the main screen in just a second. Um, are we doing this? Yeah, here we go. Okay, so uh, as we can see, some of these have been upvoted, um, and I'm just gonna ask questions probably in order as they appear. Um, Savannah, the first one would be for you. How hard was it to convince Louisville to adopt low-income residential program to adopt a low-income residential program and combine it with uh, an energy program? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'm with the Office of Sustainability at Louisville Metro Government. And, you know, obviously we were all about the equitable clean energy transition, but it does require us to work with a lot of partners. So we did reach out to our Office of Housing. They're a big partner on this, as well as our Affordable Housing Trust Fund. These are all organizations that have a lot more expertise in the multifamily sector. And, uh, you know, they know because they work with these uh, residents day in and day out that sometimes you can put low income residents in a new home, but if they can't pay the bills and keep the lights on, then you're not really helping them long term. So they were definitely very much on board with um, partnering with us on this program and sharing data and doing whatever we need to to increase synergies. So I think that there has been a good institutional understanding of the problems and the need for this solution at Louisville Metro. Thank you, Sameda. And if anyone has a follow-up to that, please uh, feel free to add it to Slido. Um, the next one I see here, okay, so this, this gets updated in real time. This is great. So on this screen, I'm going to read off this. So Bert, you're up next. Were you able to qualify for any energy uh, incentives for the conversion to electric forklift, uh, an electric forklift fleet? And then no, you... unfortunately, and this, and unfortunately, in this case, we were not. Um, this is in Pennsylvania. Um, we've been much more successful in Maryland um, with, with incentives. Okay. Um, again, if anyone has follow up, please put it in the Slido. Jules, are there markets that NIM has decided to exit based on climate physical risk to that region? Um, at this time, no. Um, our ESG team is a part of our, the, the team that we sit under, the larger team is the research risk and analytics team. So uh, we are constantly discussing um, what the future impacts from climate change might mean for specific mm -hmm. markets. But uh, currently, all of our analyses are asset specific rather than market specific. Thanks, Jules. I think the next question here is for Sadie. And as it appears, I'm going to ask it, but I just want to be very clear. This is not my opinion, and I'm not speaking for DOE on this one. Uh, would a carbon tax complement multifamily financing to assist decarbonization? Um, there's no question that a carbon tax would complement multifamily financing if it was structured correctly. 
um, it is, you know, when you think about resources required um, to decarbonize buildings, um, you know, $27 billion is a lot of money, $369 billion is a lot of money, but it's not nearly enough. Um, a consistent source of capital from a, a carbon tax of some kind um, could be great, um, but I think it's going to be difficult. It certainly doesn't exist. Uh, we have the closest thing that you could have in New York City with Local Law 97 and fines, and even just rolling out that program um, is incredibly challenging um, and difficult. We'll see how it all goes in 2024, and perhaps that can be, um, you know, a, uh, an indicator of, of how a broad carbon tax or some kind of a carbon assessment um, could help complement not just multifamily, but really specifically low-income and affordable housing in disadvantaged communities. Thanks, Sadie. If you don't mind staying on the screen, I'd love to ask the next one to you, too. Uh, how can we find out more details regarding the incentives for multifamily housing from the IRA? So there are lots of webinars. I was just looking, something just popped up, <laughs> um, that are being um, rolled out that, that do just this for you. And there are lots of lawyers and accountants that have um, figured a lot of this out. I'm not an expert. Um, but I can certainly share with Better Buildings uh, links to some of the, the webinars and other things, other resources that can be sent out so that people can access that information. Thank you, Sadie. And I think as part of that, we want to uh, draw attention to an announcement that was made at the summit this year by a deputy secretary that the Better Building Solutions Center would uh, feature a financing options section of our navigator, financial navigator, um, to become a repository for uh, incentives and um, initiatives that can support uh, through the IRA, through IRA and Bill that can support efficiency upgrades. We've built out this section of our website in beta format. Uh, we'll share the link as part of the follow-up or in the chat here. Um, that's something that's an ongoing effort. And if people have comments or want to suggest ways to improve it, please be in touch with us. Um, <clears throat> I am inclined next to go, okay, more info about Solar for All. That's another thing we can also just uh, share a link for. Um, so you made it this one. I don't know if you want to chime in on here. So what is the political climate of Louisville compared to the rest of the Kentucky regarding decarbonization, decarbonizing electrical generation, electrification to accelerate reduction of GHG emissions, and urgency to update energy building codes? That's a big question. Yeah, and I will try to answer it briefly, but um, Louisville is the most populous city in Kentucky, and as you'll see with more larger urbanized, more populous cities, we are a more, you know, a, they call it a blueberry in a tomato soup or a blue bubble in the Red Sea, <laughs> basically. So um, there is a lot more support for climate action and building codes and energy efficiency and clean energy and things like that, which is what ultimately led to our city council passing those ambitious goals and resolutions. Um, I think the challenge now is just working with the state, finding synergies where those are possible and then doing things within our control. So for example, we may not be able to expeditiously get the state to update a building code, but we are looking into doing a voluntary benchmarking program with the multifamily affordable uh, housing developers that we're gonna be working with or the properties. Um, so, so we're finding ways to within those constraints, uh, try to do things that help us achieve our goals. Great, thanks, Sumita. Um, Bert, I want to jump down to this one about an energy treasure hunt because I think that's an area that is part and parcel to our work with better plants in the market. And I'm wondering if you can expand upon the process of an energy treasure hunt. Yeah, sure. Um, the key words with the energy treasure hunt are first, operational and behavioral opportunities. And secondly, you're looking for low cost, no cost opportunities. So what you do, you go in on a Sunday or other down day where you can go into, in our case, a plant and you listen for compressed air leaks, you listen for equipment, machinery running, um, you look for office spaces or other spaces that are conditioned that don't really need to be or the temperature should, should be set back. And then you go back in on Monday and you look at the operational conditions. Um, that gives you a chance to talk to people, talk to operators, talk to build to other people who work in the building, um, and and 
look at that and compare it with the non-operational condition days. And then you, you find opportunities, you can quant, quant, quantify them, and um, you usually do a presentation to management on the last day. Um, so DOE does have a toolkit for this now. Um, so it, I'm not sure exactly where that is um, on, on the, somewhere on the Solution Center. We'll share it, yep. Yeah, if you wanna share that, then um, there is a toolkit for it. And you can even apply for an implant training for treasure hunts. Um, from the DOE, if you want them to facilitate it. Thank you for that flag, Bert. If we could stay with you um, for the Volvo presentation, electric boilers have huge demand and need massive electrical upgrades and can stress certain grids where heat pumps are variable refrigerant flow considered instead. Were heat pump and variable refrigerant flow considered instead? How about geothermal heat pumps? This is an area that our uh, industrial office is doing a lot of work in right now, as well as on the commercial side, our buildings office. Bert, do you have any response? to this for Volvo's portfolio? Um, yeah, what we've seen is it's, it's very expensive to install the infrastructure for those and they won't quite get to the operating temperatures we need for our manufacturing processes, um, which are normally above 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but we are looking at air to air heat pumps. Um, we just had a very good session with Train who presented also presented at the conference. Um, looking at heating spaces or cooling spaces. Um, but right now for our operational needs, um, that we can't get to the temperatures we need with, with heat pumps. Thanks, Bert. Uh, I think we have time probably for one more. Um, I want to acknowledge too, there is a question here about uh, natural gas bans for existing buildings. Not relevant, I'm not going to cover it. Our focus is on resource efficiency. Um, that's a separate unrelated topic. Uh, Jules, I'm wondering if you can take this one here about um, where to go. Uh, On-site power generation a positive effect on the property value, how valuable? Is this something in your modeling that you all take into account as you're considering actions related to your assets? Sure. I mean, I guess that's um, it, that's definitely a question that has a long answer, and it can totally vary to based on location, based on how tenants pay for their utilities, if a solar project might be owned by us, if it's a community solar project, if, it, if it's a PPA. Um, so it can it can vary. Um, but I will say that there are NEBS, non-energy benefits from having solar on site, such as uh, recruiting tenants to a, a property. Um, and um, there are, I mean, we're seeing things too, like lower NOI. Um, in DC, we just completed a really large project and we're benefiting from the valuable SREX here. So there are um, there are a lot of ways that solar has been valuable to us. It just varies by project and by region. Thank you, Jules. With that, why don't we go to the next slide? I want to put a plug in for our uh, summer webinar series. Here we go. Yes. Okay. So this, as I mentioned, is the first one in the summer series. This is a screenshot from uh, the calendar that can be found online outlining uh, upcoming sessions. Our next one is on June 22nd, titled Paying the Price, How Internal Carbon Pricing Supports Emissions Reduction. Uh, this will be, uh, I think, another very good one, uh, focusing on internal carbon pricing schemes for assessing capital projects. Um, and a full session can be viewed, as I mentioned, online. Uh, I have 11.59 a.m. I want to end on time, so I'm just going to do a quick closing and say thank you very much to our panelists, to my colleagues. Oh, there, I slipped over the side with the info about that one. Uh, my colleagues, um, if you have follow-up questions um, that weren't able to get answered in our discussion today, we've all uh, listed our contact info here. Please feel free to reach out. And with that, I want to thank all of our attendees for joining us and wish you a happy afternoon. Take care, everyone.